now. So, um, and let's see, I also need to share my screen. So I, uh, I just wanted to, okay, let's see, I'm not in presentation. Mode. Let's do that. Okay. Oh, no, that didn't work. All right. Well, that's fine. Um, so I just wanted to um, start off today's lesson by saying that um, this is a lesson where it'd be so easy for me to just really get out in the weeds on the gory details of uh, file input and output. Some of you may be interested in the weeds, but most of you probably just want to get the job done. So uh, I, I want to say two things that will maybe make your life easier if you're not interested in getting out in the weeds. One is that um, there is a way of interacting with data, sort of the data science version of Python that involves a library called NumPy. And, um, and NumPy is also a core piece of Pandas, which is like a big uh, data, uh, data science sort of library. And the intermediate Python lessons that are going on right now actually um, are, are using NumPy arrays. And so if you're interested in this, uh, those are all recorded as videos. So you can go back and look at that. And so the advantage, one of the advantages of that is there's just like an open command. You give the open command and boom, the whole uh, like Excel or CSV file is read in and it's in the form of an array. So it's super easy. Um, and the methods that we're going to use today are kind of way more granular. So we're going to talk about like what actually happens when you open a file, because maybe you have things that are in files that aren't Excel spreadsheets or CSV file. Maybe it's just a list of text or something like that. So I think there's some value in understanding sort of what's going on when you're reading things in and out of files. But the other thing is that um, you should sort of fear not because there is actually, um, if you go to the lesson page and look at the left side of the screen, there's four things on here. Template code for reading in a CSV as a list of lists. Template code for writing a list of lists as a CSV. And then a similar pair for reading in a CSV as a list of dictionaries and for writing a list of dictionaries. So as we saw um, in the last couple lessons, this um, sort of complicated data structures where you have a list where each list is basically a row about a particular thing on a spreadsheet, if you want to think of it that way. And then you can either read that, that row as a list if you want to refer to the items on that row, the columns by row, by column number, or as a dictionary, if you want to have names for all the columns. So these two data structures, list of lists and list of dictionaries are like super useful. And they're sort of the basic um, Python equivalent of these NumPy arrays where you, like in NumPy, where you just click on the button and you get an array of numbers. So this is a, a more granular way of recreating that. So if you get sort of like lost in the sauce here, just you can just take the template code for reading in a CSV as a list of lists, copy it and paste it in your code that you're trying to write, and you don't really have to worry about the gory details of how it works. I do sort of feel like I need to go into a few gory details partly because of the whole gotcha thing. A lot of times when you're working with files, weird things happen and you can't figure out like, why is this not working? And so if you're sort of aware, so I'm gonna talk about some different features of files and this may give you some ideas at least where to start if uh, you're trying to work with files and the thing that you're expecting to happen actually doesn't happen. The other thing that I want to say before we start off today is that the there is, I guess you could sort of say an issue with the CoLab notebooks. We've been using the CoLab notebooks um, as a way to run code up in the cloud. 
The problem is we are now reading and writing from data files. And if we read and write from data files, they're gonna be data files in the, in the cloud. They are not gonna be data files in your own computer. In fact, if you write to a data file in a Colab notebook, I actually haven't figured out where that file goes or where it is. So, I mean, you can do it. And then if you read in from that file, it's there. I just don't know how you look on Colab, the Colab platform, to look at the files. So I'm actually going to be running this um, on as a Jupyter notebook on my local computer. And uh, the Jupyter notebook basically is going to look exactly the same as the Colab notebook, but the difference is I'm running this Jupyter notebook out of my home directory. So if I do a command that says, save this in a file, I can go to my home directory and look at it and see what's in the file. So that's why I'm, um, why I'm doing it this way. So if you want to sort of like dissect what's going on and look at the files, you can either figure out how to run the notebooks as a Jupyter notebook, or you can go to the web page for the lesson and just copy the code examples and paste them into Thani or some other uh, uh, IDE or code editor and run them in that way. So anyway, but you can you can do all the exercises on the in the Colab notebook. You just basically won't be able to see the result in terms of what's actually in the file. Okay, so having said those um, sort of preliminary things, let's go ahead and talk about um, this week's lesson. Actually, does anybody have any questions about the preliminary things before we launch into this? Okay, well, I will go ahead and go forward. So these are sort of our goals for today. So the first thing I already talked about, which is essentially I wanna provide code examples that you can copy and paste. If you just wanna read in text from a plain text file, or if you wanna read from CSV files. Um, now you'll notice I said reading from CSV files and not reading from Excel files. Um, there, are, there is actually a library that reads in from Excel files, but CSV is sort of like the really most generic way to get a spreadsheet. And you can actually um, take an Excel file and output it as a CSV file, and then use it, uh, input it according to the methods that we're gonna look at today. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about CSV files, but just be aware that there are libraries if you wanna read directly from an Excel file. Otherwise you have to export them as a CSV file. So there's a couple things that I wanna talk about as, as sort of background. One is that we talked about the new line character as a um, kind of special uh, character where we, we say backslash n, and it doesn't draw an n on the screen, it actually does like a hard return and goes down to the next line. It turns out that new line characters play a super important role in data files. That is essentially how Python knows where the next record begins in a data file that's been saved. So learn, understanding a little bit about what's going on with new line characters in, is important. The other thing that I also wanted to mention is UTF-8 character encoding. If you've ever had the experience of opening a, a spreadsheet or something, and instead of your nice little diacritics like accent aigu or tildes or whatever, you end up with these square boxes that don't have anything in them. If that happens to you, this is a character encoding issue. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit about UTF encoding, but the Take home messages, if you can use UTF encoding, it's awesome. You should always use it and never use anything else. Even if you don't understand what UTF encoding is, um, it's the solution to most of your problems. And then the last thing is, I also wanna talk just a little bit about what CSV files actually are, um, because understanding what they are will help us understand a little bit about the methods that we can use to read them into Python. And these methods that we're using are the uh, dot .reader, dot .writer, and dict .reader. These are all a part of the CSV uh, library that is one of the ones you can import into Python. Okay, so let's talk about UTF just a little bit. Back in the battle days, like when I was in college, there was basically ASCII. So ASCII was an, a way to encode 95 Latin characters, numbers, and symbols 
in a way that computers could read them in and out. But, you know, that was fine when all of the people using computers were Americans. But once you got outside of English speaking countries, there's a whole lot of characters that we don't have. Plus, and there's important things like being able to write your text in Klingon if you're into that kind of thing. So it became clear very early on that we needed a better system than just resorting to these 95 Latin characters. And so Unicode is a way of representing 150 different character sets. In fact, the num that number is growing because people are constantly adding new character sets. So like Greek or Cyrillic or uh, Norwegian or any kind of character set that has characters that we you can't represent with a Latin alphabet. So the question though is how do you take these numbers and actually represent them in a file? And it turns out that UTF-8 is a really clever way of doing that. I'm not going to go in the gory, gory details about how, you, how UTF-8 works, but it's really interesting. And a key feature of it is that it is backwards compatible to ASCII. So if you have any old files that have ASCII characters in them, they will read in perfectly as UTF-8. So um, UTF-8 is awesome. If you want to represent a non-Latin character, we saw in a previous lesson that you can escape it with backslash U, which indicates that the next four digits after that are the Unicode code point. In other words, the four digit hexadecimal number that stands for that particular non-Latin character. And so if you want to put that into your uh, code, you can use this sort of escape sequence. Basically, if you ever get an option to use UTF-8, like when you're saving a file, you should always use it. Um, okay, so that's, a, I'm, I'm not gonna go too much further out in the weeds on UTF-8 other than that. So let's talk next about um, file objects. So we, I think I said in like one of the very first lessons that pretty much everything in Python is some kind of an object. And a file object is a new kind of object that we haven't learned about so far. You create a file object using the open function. And as is the case with other object, um, objects, it has methods. And the ones that we're interested in are dot read, dot write, and dot read lines. The other thing that is interesting about a file object is that it is an iterable thing. So remember when we were talking about loops, we said that like a list was an iterable thing because you could go through each item one at a time. A string is an iterable thing because you can go through one letter at a time. And a file is an iterable thing because you can read in records one record at a time using a for loop just as you can with the other types of iterable objects. So um, let's uh, take a look at a few examples here. Um, and before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit. So as I said before, we'll see that the new line character is important in, no, in, uh, in determining when you iterate through a file where the beginning of one record and the end of, uh, and the beginning of the next record is. Um, the other thing is that um, you may not have noticed this, but when you use the print function in Python, in addition to um, moving the cursor down to the next line, it also puts in an extra new line. And so when you see it on the screen, you see like an empty space in there. Um, and so we will see that if we, that, it is possible to print to a data file, but if we do that, we have this issue of getting uh, double spacing in the file. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first example. So again, I'm gonna do this on my Jupyter Notebook so that I can look at my local file. So the first thing that I wanna do, I'm gonna create a file called datafile.txt, and I wanna show you first that there isn't any data file.txt. It should be right here and it's not there. Now, if I um, run this code, uh, it opens a file called data file.txt. The W stands for write and the T stands for text. 
and then the encoding is UTF-8. It is possible to get away with leaving off this encoding argument, but I recommend just always putting it in there. There have been times when I thought, oh, well, I don't need to put that in, and then I've had stupid errors and I couldn't figure out for a half hour what was causing them, and it turned out it was because I didn't put the encoding. So it's best to just always put in the encoding whether you need to or not. So it's going to open this file object, and then you see here's the write method, which I talked about. And it'll take whatever the text is here and write it into the file. And then it will close the file. Now, one of the interesting things is that um, even though we are saying write, it does, it is writing the text into the file object, but the file object doesn't actually get written to the disk necessarily until I close it. So if you forget to put the close statement in, and then you go and look and see where did my file go, um, sometimes it won't be there. So uh, let's go ahead and run this. Now, if I go back to my home directory again, I see here is datafile.txt. And if I double click on it, I can see that, uh, oh, this is uh, something, wrong one. Okay, here it is, datafile.txt. Let me just make it a little bit bigger so you can see. You can see it's just a simple text file that has those letters that I wanted to put in it. Um, now, uh, let's see, I guess I should, I should delete it. There is actually a shortcut way to do this. So if you want to avoid having to remember to close the file, there is a version of the open statement called with. And so what you do is you say with, and then you have the open statement, and then you say as file object. And so what that will do is open the file object and keep it opened as long as the indented code block that you've written below is still indented. So we see the same pattern that we saw with other um, uh, kinds of things that use indented code blocks like for statements and ifs. You have a colon, you have an indented code block. So basically it's going to do all of this stuff and when it gets to, when the indentation level drops back out to the left margin again or when you reach the end of the script, it will then automatically perform this close operation without us having to say that. So essentially, this three-line script here does exactly the same thing as the four-line script. So let's try running that. That's, uh, there it is again, datafile.txt, and it has the same stuff in it as it did before. OK, uh, so there's a couple variations. And again, I'm not going to um, go into the weeds on this here. But um, if you try this on your own, you will see that there is a difference whether you use the write function and you write three lines out into the file, and if you use the print option and print them. And the difference that you'll see has to do with the, uh, whether they're on the same line or whether they're on separate lines or not. But I'll leave that up to you to go ahead and try for your, on your own. Okay, um, so does anybody have any questions uh, about writing the files? I've, I've been charging along rather fast here. If you, anybody have questions before we talk about reading? All right, uh, if there aren't any questions, then I'll go ahead. So again, I'll just rerun this to write the text in the file. Now, if we look at this reading um, code here, it's very much like the writing code. Once again, you're opening the data file, but instead of using a W for write, you use an R for read. And then you use the, um, the, re the dot read method. And notice that it doesn't have any arguments in it. There's nothing you need to pass into this method because it's going to read from the file object take whatever it finds and put it into this variable called some text. And then it'll close the file and print whatever the text is. So if I run this, 
it says exactly what I put into the file. If I change this and uh, run this script, now when I read from the file, it says going into the black hole. And again, you can use the same shortcut um, and you can uh, um, just leave out the close and use the indented code block method here. And that will essentially do exactly the same thing. Okay, so um, I think that in the interest of time, um, I am not going to, uh, let's see, I guess actually I need to, to run through these. Okay, so here uh, you remember that in the, um, some of the earlier sessions, we talked about this thing called a multi-line uh, literal string. If, you, if we put a single quotation mark, then we can create a string that's all on one line. But if our string goes across several lines and we wanna preserve the new line characters that are at the end of each line, then we can start this and end the string with triple quotes and that will essentially make it be exactly the way we have it here with the, uh, the new line characters. So if I um, run this script and then I go back here and open datafile.txt, we see that it, it did write the three strings and it put each of them on a separate line because um, the string that I was writing had new line characters at the end of it. You'll also notice if I click on the bottom of this, there is actually an invisible new line character at the end of the third line because I put these triple quotes on the next line. So there's a new line character that we can't see there. And, um, and that is why I'm, I can make the cursor go down to the last line here. Uh, okay, now if I wanna read from this, remember we said that a, um, that a file object is an iterable thing and that the uh, way that we know where one record ends and another record begins is by the new lines, then, um, okay, I got rid of my file and I shouldn't have. Okay, so um, it will consider the first line because it, that is where it goes to the first new line as the first iterable thing. The second line will be the second iterable thing. The third line will be the third iterable thing. So if I iterate through the file object, it'll, re, it'll basically iterate through one line at a time. And so the first time it iterates, the line will be the first line and then the second line and then the third line. And so I'm gonna tell it to print each of them. And uh, let's see what happens. Okay, so um, it printed the, uh, the three lines. And notice um, if I ask what is the length of the last line I read in, it says it's 11 characters long. If I count here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. The 11th character is actually the invisible new line character that's stuck on the end. And that's why when I tell it to print this, it's printing it's going to the next line because there's a new line character included as a part of the string. Um, so is this good or bad? It just depends on whether I wanna have a new line character at the, uh, at the end of each line. Now, in this script here, I iterated through the lines one at a time and just printed them. But if I want, I can create a list and read them in one at a time and then add them onto the list. So I'm gonna create an empty list, read in each line one at a time, and then um, I will uh, add it, each one to a list and then print the list to see what it looks like. So 
here's what the list looks like. And as you can see, when I tell it what when I tell it to print what's in the list, I can see that these new new line characters are actually showing up as a part of the string itself, which I can't I cannot see them if I print them because it literally goes to the next line. But if I have it show me what's in the list, I can see that they're there. If I want to get rid of them, there is a, a, a string method called dot strip. And what that does is it strips off any leading or trailing white space. Um, so like if there's extra spaces or new line characters on either end of the string, it will get rid of them. So if I apply that function to the line that I've read in before I put it on the list, then let's see what happens. Okay, now I don't have those trailing new lines. So again, you know, this is like kind of getting in the weeds here, but I, I just want to let you know about this because sometimes you'll get in a situation like, why does this thing have all, of, why does this double spacing all these things and I don't want it to? Um, you can know that it's this sort of a problem. Okay, so this is the part I'm going to skip over. There's several alternate ways that you can read things in from a file, but um, that involves a level of detail that you can investigate on your own. Most people probably don't care about that. So if you basically have a, a text file that has a bunch of lines in it, um, you can basically take this code here, copy it and paste it, and it'll take those lines of text that are in your file and create a list where each item is one of the where each line is one item on the list. So this is basically a reusable code block that you can use in your own code. All right, does anybody uh, have questions about this before we go on and talk about CSV files? Okay, let's talk about CSVs. Uh, okay, I went too far here, let's see. Okay, here we go. So a CSV file, I mentioned that it, it's sort of like your generic way of, of uh, storing spreadsheets. And um, you can edit CSV files um, directly as raw code if you have a code editor. I don't really recommend doing that because a CSV file as raw code is really ugly looking. I have some some hardcore coder friends who always edit them this way, but I don't. It's actually better if you use a spreadsheet editor. And of course, Excel is like the most well-known spreadsheet editor. However, if you're working with CSV files, I recommend that you do not use Excel. Um, most of the time you can get away with it, but Excel does certain things to CSV files that are, that are annoying and that can also be uh, insidious. So like the most evil thing that Excel does is if you have a CSV file that has a dash in it, like 1-5, it doesn't read it in as a string that's 1-5. It automatically turns it into January 5th, whether you want it to or not. And there is, as far as I can tell, absolutely no way to turn that off. So I've gotten so, uh, irritated with Excel that I basically never use it to use to work with CSV files. LibreOffice and OpenOffice, which are two um, open source uh, alternatives to Excel, work really well. And you can go into the settings and do things like turn off the automatic uh, conversion of dates, which you cannot do in Excel. Uh, so once you get LibreOffice set up, there's some other things you want to do, like have it stop using smart quotes, which are also really irritating. But once you get it set up, you can reliably open and edit CSV files and then save them and have them still be openable in your code. So that's the way that I um, recommend. So um, what I'm, uh, I'm not really going to uh, go into a lot of detail about looking at what the raw code of CSV file looks like. It's something you can experiment with if you want. Um, 
you can go to either, uh, so you can go to the directory where the CSV file is living and then open it with a code editor like VS Code or Atom um, or Notepad even, and if you wanna look at them. But the place where you have to look in the place where you're running the code. So it either where you initiated Python or if you're using Jupyter Notebooks, it's in the directory where the notebook lives. If, it's, if you're using Colab, you're basically not gonna be able to look at it because it's gonna be up in the cloud somewhere. So if you were to open up a raw CSV file in a code editor, it would look something like this. CSV stands for comma separated values. And so what that means is basically each value in the row is separated by a comma. So if you wanna think of these as fields, so, so each row is like a record in database terms, each um, of these is like a field, or if you wanna think of it as a spreadsheet, each row in the file that ends with a new line is like a row in the table, and each thing separated by column is like, uh, by comma is like one of the columns in the table. And so if you read this CSV text, in as a CSV file in something like OpenOffice Calc, it will actually represent it as a table. So here's what it looks like as raw text. Here's what it looks like as a table. Now, one of the issues is if this is a comma separated file, what if the thing that, that you wanna read in has a comma in it? Well, then CSV puts it in quotation marks. Okay, well then what happens if your thing has quotation marks. So there's a whole set of rules for dealing with these special cases. Um, but basically, that's one of the reasons why you don't really want to be messing with the CSV files as raw text. It's better to just let your CSV editor, like uh, OpenOffice or LibreOffice, do the opening and saving for you, and then you don't run into problems with these weird things like, um, like commas and quotation marks. Um, so one of the things that, that, um, that you should know when you open a CSV file for the first time, and let me go ahead and, uh, open a new file. Uh. Oh, here we go. All right, cool. That's what I wanted. Uh, okay, so when you open a new file for the first time and you start um, typing things in it, then the first time when you go to save it, um, it's, it needs to know some things about um, how you want it to be saved. So a dialog will come up saying like, how do you want to save it? So obviously the name and the place where you want to save it, but you also want to say, I want to save it as text CSV. Then um, it says edit filter settings. I want to do this because this is where I get to choose some really important things. So because this is LibreOffice and LibreOffice is good, it's defaulting to UTF-8. If you do this in Excel, a lot of times it'll do some other weird character set that's not UTF-8. Um, the other thing is that you can also select what you wanna use as the field delimiter. It turns out that there's another file, uh, another file format called TSV, which stands for tab separated um, values. And so if you want to save it, if, if the, the group you're working with saves things as TSV files, then you want to select tab here. Um, but generally, I just use comma. Now when I do this, um, it will go ahead and save this uh, as UTF-8 and as a CSV file. So um, like I said, the software usually handles all of the, the gory details about um, saving the files and so on. And uh, here's the thing that I mentioned about uh, this problem with Excel. So these are just sort of some general notes about CSV files. Um, does anybody have any questions they wanna ask about this before we look at how to read them in with Python? Uh, 
Okay, well, let's go ahead. Um, so I mentioned that, um, that there were two uh, methods in the CSV module that we care about. There's reader, uh, dot reader and dot dict reader, which are for reading in lines of CSV files as lists and as dictionaries respectively. There's also a corresponding one called write CSV, which takes a list and writes it as the line of a CSV file. And there's another one called, um, I forget what it's called, but uh, uh, write dict or something, um, which will take a line of, uh, uh, that will take a dictionary and write it out as the line of a CSV file. There's a lot of details uh, about exactly what you have to do to make these things work. But like I said, I have some code examples that you can just use. Um, and so when you're doing the, uh, the dict reader and the reader methods, um, as you might recall, um, the, when, because a file is an iterable object, each time you, uh, you read in a line using one of these two methods, you're gonna read it in, and then the next time you do that operation, you're gonna read in the next row, and you're gonna read in the next row. Now, and until you iterate all the way through the whole file. The problem is that if, what if you wanna go back up to a previous line? Then you have to close the file and then read them all in over again, and that's really kind of annoying. You really don't wanna to have to do that. So the solution to that is to basically, each time you read in a file from your CSV spreadsheet, go ahead and take that line and stick it in a list. Once you've stored away each line in a list, then you essentially have a, a list of lists, if you use the reader function, or a list of dictionaries, if you use the dict reader function. And then you can go back and randomly jump around to any line in the in your spreadsheet that you want. Okay, so again, we're sort of getting out in the weeds here, but um, let's go ahead and uh, try running some code. So um, here is that example text, and I'm just like literally writing it as text with the commas and everything in it, just like we saw there. I'm going to open up a text file. Uh, and, and write this text out to it. Okay, and so if I, let's see, what is it called? Students.csv. So if I go to, uh, okay, now where is my home directory? Here we go. If I go to my home directory and I say, uh, okay, here's students.csv. If I say to open this with um, the text editor application, you'll see it's just a blob of text, just the way that I wrote it into the file. But normally we don't do that. Normally what we wanna do is open it in uh, the, well, for me, my default, uh, application is LibreOffice. Okay, and so here is, um, ah, come on. okay, well, I can't make that other window go away because I'm on the import process. So when I open a file like this, again, this is sort of like the parallel uh, um, or the opposite operation of when I saved a CSV file for the first time, it's going to ask me some things like um, what, how is this CSV file structured? I mean, one of the big differences is between a CSV file and an Excel file, and one of the reasons why Excel files are so co complicated uh, is because Excel keeps track of all these things for you. CSV files are really simple. They don't keep track of things like what is a character encoding or what kind of separators are you using. And it actually looks like the last time I was reading in files, I was using a pipe as a separator, and this file doesn't use pipes. So I want to deselect that 
and say that it's separated with commas. Once I do that, now it, it's rendering it correctly as a table. If it were tab delineated, then I could say that here. Uh, also, if there was a character encoding other than UTF-8, I could select this. I think the one that, the annoying one that, um, at least on uh, Windows computers, they use like Western European Windows 1252 or something stupid like that. So this is your way to ensure that your diacritics and your uh, Chinese characters and stuff will all get written in correctly. So if I do this, now it does not read it in as just the series of characters. It actually renders it as a table, which is what I, which is what I want. Okay, let's see here. I should have cleared my desktop off better. Now, if I want to read the file in, here I'm going to go through um, sort of the operation that I was describing to you verbally before. Um, I can open up the file for reading. I do not have to say when I'm going to use the CSV reader method, I don't have to say that I'm reading in text. It'll know that because I'm using the reader object. Um, so I'll open it uh, up as a reader object. And then if I, uh, if I um, just say, you know, what is this thing? It'll say it's a reader object. Then I can go through that reader object and read in each row one at a time. I'm going to have it print what kind of thing the row is and then actually print the row. So let's try that and see what happens. Okay, so the first thing it did, as I said, what kind of thing is it? It says it's a reader object. Then as I go through and read in each row, I'm asking what kind of thing is it? It is a list. And then I'm asking it to show me what that list is. So um, this is exactly what the CSV reader does, is it reads in each line in the table as a list. And so as I said before, if I want to keep those for using later, then as I read in each of those lists, I need to stash it away in, um, as a list of lists. So this function that I've defined up here at the top is the function that does that. So I open the reader object, I create an empty list, then I go through each row of the spreadsheet, reading them in one at a time. And as, a, as we saw up here, each row that gets read in is going to be a list. So I append it to my list of lists. And when I'm done, the th this list of lists is, is a list where each of the outer list items is an inner list that represents the row. Um, also, I have to remember if I'm going to use this function, it depends on the CSV module, so I have to remember to import that. So if you want to use this code to create a list of lists, this is the part that you need to copy and paste into your own code. And then when you want to call it, uh, you just call the function like this. Um, so this is going to go ahead and read the CSV file that I wrote with the student information. Uh, then it's going to print the whole thing, which is the whole list of lists. Then I'll have it pick through and get what is on row one, item two. And then this is some code here that is going to read through or is going to step through each of the lines. And then it's going to step through each of the columns and it'll print, it'll uh, create a string that has the data that's in that column and put a tab after it. And then after it finishes with each row, it'll put a new line. And so the idea is I'm creating an output string that's going to sort of look like a table. It doesn't actually do a very good job, but let's try running this and see what happens. Okay, so the first thing I said is to have it tell me, um, the, show me the whole list of lists. So here's my list of lists here. And then I ask, what is row one, item two? So row one is here. Item two, zero, one, two is Rastaman27. OK, and that's what it said here. And then here is this, uh, I created basically a single string by concatenating each item 
with tabs in between them and then sticking new lines on the end. And like I said, it doesn't do a very good job because like my tab stops aren't lined up. So uh, this is, if you had items in each column that were the same length, it would line up a little better on the screen. On the screen. So I've created an alternate version in, in this uh, example here. It assumes that the first uh, row in the table is the same as every other row. But as you know, in a lot of spreadsheets, the first row actually has column headers in it. So if you want to skip the header row, then um, you can use copy and paste this function. And then the second argument that you pass in is whether there is a header row. If there's a header row and you want it to be skipped, uh, then you put true. If there isn't any, or if you don't want to skip the header row, you put false. But otherwise, this function works the same way as the first one. Okay, and here's an example uh, that I'm not going to go through because you have to download the data file first, the states.csv, and we're about to run out of time. So you can try doing the download and then trying this yourself. Um, the write CSV basically, um, wor this works the opposite way as the read one. So here I'm starting off with a list of lists. And then um, I'm opening the file for writing. And then I'm going through using CSV writer and and writing each of these rows, this row, this row, this row, one at a time. And then uh, when it's finished, it'll close the file for me. So uh, if I run this, okay, it should have saved a file called cartoons.csv. Uh, there it is. If I double click on it, I made a CSV file. Cool. From a list of lists. Okay, here's some more experimenting. And then here again is template code. If you want to take a list of lists and write it to a file, you can just copy and paste this code. So here's my list of lists. Uh, and if I run that, it'll go ahead and uh, save it in a file called test.csv. So the last thing that I'm going to do, and again, I'm not going to go into a lot of details here, but I said that, um, you know, it's convenient when we were looking at lists of lists and lists of dictionaries. The nice thing about lists of dictionaries is you don't have to keep track of the position of the columns in your table. So, you know, like let's say you have a table like this uh, cartoon characters table where the names are in one column, the companies are in one column, and the nemesis is in another column. Well, if you do a list of lists, you have to remember which column is which. But if you read it in as a list of dictionaries, then you don't have to keep track of that. So one of the differences between um, the list of uh, the, uh, the dict reader and the regular uh, reader object is that it assumes that the first row in the table is the column headers. And what it's going to do is basically take the column headers that are um, in the file and turn them into the keys for the list of lists. So this example here actually uses the spreadsheet that we created. And if we compare that with um, the code here, OK, go away. There we go. We can see that when I refer to these uh, items with the key of name, company, and nemesis, it's actually getting those from, uh, okay, clicked in the wrong thing again. It's actually getting name, company, and nemesis from the column headers. So the first row does, isn't actually considered to be data, it's considered to be the keys that it's going to use in the, um, the key value pairs for the list of dictionaries. And then, so the name for the first record is Mickey Mouse. The name for the second record is Roadrunner. The company for the first one is Disney. The company for the second one is Warner Brothers. So if I try running this code, it 
So I ask what kind of thing it is. It is a dict reader. Um, and it actually reads in, they're not normal dictionaries. They're a strange thing called ordered dictionaries. So when we look at them, they don't look exactly the same, but we can see they do consist of key value pairs. And the ordered dictionaries basically work as far as we're concerned, just like regular dictionaries. So we could ask for um, cartoon character number one's name, company, and enemy, and it pulled out Roadrunner, Warner Brothers, and Wiley e. Coyote. So as I did with the other ones, here's some template code you can copy and paste if you want to read things in as a list of dictionaries. And then there's also a template here if you want to take a list of dictionaries and write it as a CSV file. So anyway, you can take these functions and play around with them. Try make a spreadsheet in Excel and see if you can read it in and out of code. And I've burned through our time for this week. Um, one of the irritating things about, um, about this is that um, you have to actually have the file on your computer. And so what we're going to do next week, which is sort of like, I think the most exciting week, is to try getting um, data directly from somewhere on the web. So like in that states example, instead of having to download the CSV file, we can actually tell Python to just go to the website where it lives and read it directly in without having to download and then open it. So some of the pain and suffering that we've been doing this week to try to figure out how to read and write to files, we can avoid by just reading them directly from somewhere on the internet. And that's what we'll talk about in the last lesson of the series, which is next week. So sorry, I ran a couple minutes over time and I know this is kind of like a whirlwind, but um, I will go ahead and uh, stop the recording. But if you have any questions that you want to ask,